Welcome to Backroom Talk. And, uh, we're going to be having a little bit of ch a chat around coaching life cycle. The artist, the manager, and the entrepreneur, and the artist is the coach, right? It's like what we do is artistry. Yeah, I mean, uh, full disclosure, we're both part-time coaches. Yeah. Ooh. Um, yeah that's that where a, we sit. That was a dagger. If coaching was just this casual thing that you didn't have great systems in place around as a part-time coach, as a full-time coach, trying to continue to grow a book of clients, you can't get away with that. To listen to more Backroom Talk, be sure to subscribe. Learn to design personalized programs with the OPEX system of coaching by heading to opexfit.com. Well, welcome to another episode of Backroom Talk. I'm here with Carl and uh, we're going to be having a little bit of ch a chat around coaching life cycle and the progression or not progression. Yeah. You know, not everyone progresses through these stages, but we do want to lay out uh, theoretically what it could look like to go from not coaching at all to, you know, the fullest expression of, you know, being a fitness professional, uh, yeah. you know, and really scaling a fitness business. So we're going to walk through those stages today. Um, anything to add there? No, it's just very OPEX of you. You said the fullest expression, fullest expression of coaching. I like that. I think, fi one. I think I said fitness professional, which was even, uh, did I say? Uh, the I thought fullest? you said coaching, but hey, mm. not, anyway, beside the point, you did say fullest expression. That's good. Yeah. We should probably use that language in other areas that not just uh, exercise so definitely that's, that's OPEX language <laughs> <laughs> no but yeah I think it's I think it's important for people to understand where they are and, and where they want to go yep. um more so so they understand what it's so they can start to think about internally you know where 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 am I really am I okay with where I am and do I want to do with what that other person is doing that's at that like top progression stage or what we'll call scale. It's like, do I want to go there? I think it's, uh, I think it's insightful when, when uh, coaches and gym owners start to think about what do I want to do in five, 10, dare I say 20 years. Um, and they can start to kind of think about what, what uh, systems they need to put in place and, and what are the things they need to start thinking about today to eventually get to that place. Definitely. I was like just thinking as you were talking there and, making the connection a little bit to training age in my head because we talk a lot about in fitness and in exercise, understanding someone's training age to understand, you know, where their priorities and what their design is going to look like and everything like that. But I do think there is a, like an important difference between life cycle for a coach in business and then, you know, life cycle stage, training age in the gym. And that is that if someone keeps training, like they're going to progress through those stages or through their life. If a coach keeps coaching, they're not necessarily going to go through this like upwards trajectory. There will be steps back and that's not necessarily a wrong or a bad thing. Uh, but again, it's just an idea of where someone could progress if they chose to go through all those stages. Gosh, I think, uh, I think there's more similarities than we would think. Because even as you said, as someone continues to train, they will naturally go up. That's not true, right? Because what if someone's doing a suboptimal program design or they're just doing a bunch of random stuff on a daily basis and there's no progression in mind? That person could actually get worse, right? They can hurt themselves. Um, they can be, you know, attempting to do things that they are not capable of, of performing on a day-to-day -day basis. And they can stay exactly where they are or fall backwards based on injuries and time outside of the gym or time not doing movement because of those injuries or whatever the case is. So I think there are a lot of similarities to, you know, uh, the way that we look at exercise progression and the way that we look at uh, business coach life cycle pr progression or not. Yeah. Well, I think this will be a very insightful episode for, well, if, if I say so myself, <laughs> for uh, someone who is maybe thinking about getting into the industry and is not yet a coach. And then also the person who has experience and is trying to think like, what comes next for me? You know, where, mm -hmm. where do I go from here? I've built up a nice little book of clients, but what happens at this next stage in my career? So Fitness is one of those weird areas where I don't think, I think a lot of people get into coaching and they really don't have an idea of what progression in that career looks like. There's not a really clear path laid out. It's stuff that James has talked about, you know, so much over the years as to what does it actually mean to become a fitness professional. So I like that we are putting it out there and asking coaches who are at the beginning of their journey or already inside of their journey to really think about what that looks like. Yeah. I mean, I think what we're laying out is just reality, right? It's like, where can you go with this? We're not necessarily laying out a path of success where we're like, you're here, you need to be here. We're just saying, hey, within the industry right now, where we're at, this is, these are your options, right? This is, you can kind of do this here a little bit. You can go all in and do it here a little bit. And 
here are some things that you need to consider in each one of those stages. So should we just kind of roll right into like what are those stages? I think so. Um, but before we do that, because per stage, we're going to be talking about, you know, what is happening inside of it and defining what it is. We're going to be talking about potential cash, you know, that someone can make if they are in that stage, because uh, money ma- money matters, obviously. And then also tying it to the three personas, so the artist, the entrepreneur, and the manager. So I do think before we get into it and actually start stepping through those stages, maybe you could define the artist, manager, and entrepreneur. Yeah, definitely. So this is something that I took from the E-Myth. Um, it's a book I read probably a decade ago. Um, and it really resonated with me because I was in a spot at that time where I was like, who am I? Right? Like, what you know, what personas are lacking in my own personal practice. And um, that's what they laid out, right? The artist, the manager, and the entrepreneur. And the artist is the coach, right? It's like what we do is artistry, right? It's like building relationships, building program designs, building lifestyle and behavior designs, and the whole nine, right? Like that's the, the artistic part of coaching. And that's the part I think most people are attracted to. When most people come in and they say, I want to be a coach, they want to do those things. But there's more to it there's the managerial piece as well. So you have to have the ability to effectively manage your time. You have to manage your client load. You have to manage systems inside of your business or your particular coaching practice. Um, There's a lot of managing that has to take place that has absolutely nothing to do with going out and managing other coaches or uh, managing employees. You have to manage yourself, right? So all of us have to have that persona. And then finally, there's the entrepreneur. There's that part of us that has to take a step back and kind of get out of it, right? Like get out of the weeds and think like, okay, why am I doing this? What do I want to be? Where, where, where am I in this, this life cycle stage? Um, and what is it going to take for me to move forward? Um, and that's like the visionary, right? Like that's the person that, you know, they have their head in the clouds. And the interesting thing is, um, and we'll walk through it as we get through each one of these stages. The interesting thing is, is that you always need three of those things, right? Like all three of those personas at play or alive, Um, but depending on what stage you are, one will shine more than the other. One has to shine more than the other based on what you're doing on the, on a day-to-day basis and what your priorities are. So, um, yeah, as we go through, we'll lay out like, you know, based on this stage, what persona is, is most likely shining, which, which persona is the priority. So just to give people an idea, that's kind of what we're talking about when we say that. Yeah. Well, to go to stage one, uh, and this one's fairly obvious, but it's not, <laughs> not, co- not a coach. You're not yet coaching. Yeah. Uh, you might have some technical knowledge picked up from textbooks, but you don't have any experience as a coach yet. Uh, there's probably some self-confidence and self-doubt that comes along with that at this stage. And most importantly, you don't have any clients who are paying you money to coach you yet. Yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, f- in this stage, we could lay out more than three, but three three buckets come to mind. It's a lifelong learner, right? Someone that just wants knowledge. They're like, I don't want to actually coach people. I want to. I just want to know more about health and fitness, and I'm just really interested in this thing. Um, so those people will they'll consume a bunch of education, they'll consume a bunch of podcasts, and they'll watch a bunch of YouTube videos and stuff like that. And they have no intention of going out and actually coaching people. They're just like, I just like to know these things. I'm just really interested. So that's the lifelong learner. Next is the person that knows that they're going to get into coaching, but they're just not into it yet. So that person looks a lot like the lifelong learner, but their intentions are different. They're like, I'm consuming all of this information because I know in six months I'm going to get my first client. And then once I get my first client, I'm, I'm rolling, I'm going, right? So that person they're, they're most likely thinking, when is the right time, right? Um, and when we get to the next life cycle stage, it'll be really clear. It's like any time is the right time. Just do it right now. So that time, that person is just preparing to begin to coach people. And then finally, there's the person that's just uncertain, right? It's like they might be consuming some knowledge. They might be in CCP. And they're just like, I'm just not sure if I want to do this, right? Like I'm not a lifelong learner. I'm not just learning all of these things because I'm just curious and I don't have this plan to coach my first client in three months. I'm working a nine to five bank job. And I think there's something in me that wants to get into coaching, but I want to know more about it before I take that leap of faith. So, um, just immediately those three buckets come to mind of, you know, where someone is when they're in that not coaching phase, but we're having a conversation about them, right? So they're involved with fitness somehow. They're not just like someone working at Sprouts, you know, uh, selling cauliflower, right? Sorry, I say cauliflower because 
It's uh, Carson's thing. That's oh. what he wants to do when he's older. He, he wants, wants to sell cauliflower. That's adorable. <laughs> I had cauliflower for dinner last night. Oh, awesome. Yeah, it was nice. Um, I really, uh, the the not a coach stage, I think it's interesting in fitness because certainly you do get some people that are like from day one, graduate school, I want to go into fitness coaching. Like I want to be a fitness professional. I want to be a strength and conditioning coach. You certainly have a cohort of people who from the beginning know what they want to do. And that thing is fitness. But I do think it is one of those careers that a lot of people come to a little bit later than that. Mm -hmm. Like not, you know, fresh out of school dreams of doing this thing, but they have really positive experiences in fitness and have some, you know, transformation themselves. And then they decide they want to go on and coach and they yep. may be working another job or have a different degree that doesn't like necessarily align with, uh, with working with people in exercise. Yep. So I do think it's an interesting, uh, interesting stage because it's not, it's not a clear path for everyone. Yeah. yeah I would say, uh, persona wise, I think the, um, and I would like your feedback on this. The entrepreneur actually shines here for me because there's there's a decision that has to be made, right? So there's there's a level of vision that has to be, you know, thought about, right? Like they're not in the weeds, they're not coaching people. So we're not talking about, you know, the artistic side of this thing occurring. They're not like managing a bunch of things around their coaching practice because they don't have a coaching practice yet. They're they're thinking about this thing like, can I actually do this? Should I do this? Do I want to do this? So the entrepreneur really shines here. And as far as, uh, let's call it revenue coming in, this person is making no money from coaching because they're not coaching anyone. Yeah, no, I would 100% agree with that. And I have conversations with a lot of people who are at that point as well, where they're deciding, is coaching the thing that I want to do when they're deciding if they want to sign up for CCP? We've got a lot of people that take mm -hmm. the program that don't have a formal background in fitness yet. And there is this like self-talk and like overcoming the doubt and fears and uncertainty of pursuing a different kind of career. And we never tell people like quit your job, make zero dollars and think that you're going to become yeah. a successful coach. Like mm -hmm. that's not how it works. You're not just like pulling the ripcord and going into fitness, but there has to be this shift that it's like, I'm pursuing this thing now. This is going to be my priority and I'm going to do what I have to do to make this thing happen. So that's yep. a scary feeling. And I think the entrepreneur, that's that's the risk taker. That's the, the person that is overcoming uh, those feelings to go for it. Yeah. I mean, my advice here for people in this stage is, you don't have to go all in, right? You don't have to go from not coaching to all the way to the top of the ladder and, you know, commit everything to this. Um, I would actually advise these people to dip their toe in the water a little bit. Um, do you actually enjoy doing this? Um, because if you don't enjoy doing it, there's a 0% chance that you're going to be very successful for a long period of time doing it. So, um, you know, there, I, I know that there is in this stage that like nervous tension of like, do I want to do this all in? It's like, you don't, you don't have to make that decision right now, right? It's like move to the next stage, right? Once you get to that next stage and you gain some experience there, that's when you can start really thinking about, do I enjoy this? Do I really want to go all in? Um, so maybe we should go to the next stage. I think we should. Before we go there, we did say we were going to lay out like cash potential at each stage, not yet a coach. Oh, I, I did. I you said did? zero. Oh, yeah, you I did. said zero. You did. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, there we go. Right, zero I'm... dollars. Yeah. It was there. Yeah, yeah. All right. Part time. Georgia was just like <laughs> staring into my eyes, not listening to me. I don't know. I don't know what was happening. You were engaged when I said that too. I don't Sorry. Know. I yeah. think I did hear it. I just like wanted That's you to okay. reiterate zero dollars. Okay. No dollars. Zero. Nothing. You ain't mm -hmm. making nothing. Mm -mm. All right. Um, next stage is a part time coach. Yeah. yeah so um, this person is coaching as a what we call as a, a side hustle, yeah. right? They're doing it as a side hustle. Um, they might have, they might be doing a bunch of other part-time things, or they might have a full-time job that takes up most of their time and they're coaching part-time. Um, this person could be waiting for the right time to transition to become a full-time coach, or they could just be okay with where they're at. And they're like, Hey, I have no intentions on becoming a full-time coach. Like I love this career that I'm doing full-time, but I really enjoy this coaching thing. And they might be coaching like a one to five people and they're just doing that because they really enjoy it. Um, and that person is essentially just good right where they are. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, full disclosure, we're both part-time coaches. Yeah. Uh, Oof. yeah that's that where a, we sit. That was a dagger. <laughs> No, it feels strange, right? No, after after sitting in the full time role, we stepped we stepped down. Yeah, I think um, first it's like, what's the determiner of you know full time versus part time? Is it number of clients? Is it number of hours? Is it uh, the ratio of you know I'm doing this for this amount of time percentage wise and coaching for this amount of time? Um, 
Yeah, I think, uh, you know, although I don't focus on coaching individuals full time, I, I hold a client load of a full time coach uh, of a lot of full time coaches in our in our gym. Yeah. Ecosystem. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, so, gosh, I'm definitely not doing it full time, though. Right. It's like I'm not that's not my soul and main focus. Right. Like OPEX and, you know, headquarters here is my soul and main focus, not soul, but it's my main focus. Um, so yeah, it would be part-time, but someone's like my part-time is different than another coach's part-time. Um, but that's all experience, right? Definitely. And yeah. as you just said, it is the experience and the time that you spent in an owner role, uh, in, you know, scaling other businesses role that yeah. has allowed you to have a big client load, but do it in a really efficient manner. Yeah. 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 I think where my brain is, um, so that kind of caught me off guard because where my brain is, I, I do consider myself a full-time coach because I'm always thinking about that. I'm always thinking about, uh, you know, coaching coaches or coaching business owners. Um, everything that we do here is attached to people, co- you know what I'm saying? So sure. my brain is just like, oh, no, like I do, like I, I do fitness all day, every day, right? So. Yeah, that's something that I have to think about. But yeah, that caught me off guard when you said we're both part time coaches. Yeah. I don't consider myself a part time. Well, coach. sorry for uh, no, no, it's good. <laughs> no, it's, your no, no, it's no, it's a good, uh, it's a good thought experiment there. But yeah, gosh, I have to think about that one. Yeah, more. we'll stew on that uh, off camera at some point <laughs> for sure. We'll have a conversation in the back. Here Sounds in good. Uh, the back Heated. back room. Heated. Oof. The back back. <laughs> Right. So artist, manager, entrepreneur. Yeah, this is the artist, right? It's like you're, you know, within your coaching practice, you're you're just focused on gaining experience coaching people. Yeah. So this is in this life cycle stage, the most important thing is just to learn what works and what doesn't work for that new client. For sure. Or, you know, the client that you've been working for for years. It's like continually challenging yourself with that person. So it's just like, yeah, it's, that's that's the artistry, and that's like the beauty of coaching. For that part-time person that wants to grow into the full-time role and like build up their own business, really focusing on the artistry element and giving their clients the best possible service is one of the greatest ways they can do that. There's so much growth that can happen through referrals, through friends of friends, through other family members uh, that can take that part-time coach to a full-time client load. And it's not by doing a bunch of like crazy marketing efforts yeah. and things like that. Just, you know, really making their focus, giving those people the best possible service is one of the best ways to grow. Yeah, it happens accidentally a lot of the time. Yeah. Um, you know, one person comes to mind. I'm sure he wouldn't mind me mentioning his name, but for us, he'll be here in a couple of weeks. Um, I remember when he was coaching part time out of his garage and it got to a point where he had to make a decision. He's like, I have so many clients. I'm getting so many referrals. I actually can't do this in the garage anymore. I'm doing this other thing. Um, so he, he, he almost got forced into like making that decision and it kind of came at him out of nowhere. Uh, out of nowhere is not fair. It was over a period of time, but you know what I mean, right? Like it just naturally grew and then he had to make that decision based on the, the amount of clients that wanted to work with him. And it was like, okay, I'm going to, you know, do this thing full time all in. And then he went up that ladder fairly quickly. But I don't think that that's a unique story. I think that happens with a lot of good coaches, a lot of coaches that focus on the artistry and they focus on giving all of their clients a really good experience. And they actually just give a shit about their clients. It's just that growth naturally occurs. Definitely. Yeah. What's the potential for income here? Or Ooh, for cash? This is where, yeah, it gets, uh, gets weird here, right? Because we have to, we were talking about this and it's like, yeah, we have to kind of just, you know, put our stake in the ground a little bit and say like, Hey, where, where do we think potential is? And for me, it's, and we're talking U S dollars, it's 10 to $20,000 a year. Um, and there's a lot of nuance that goes into that. It's like, what's your price point? How many clients do you have to our point earlier? Like what does part-time coach really look like and mean? But, um, 10 to $20,000 is the, is the revenue that, that came to mind here yeah. for a part-time coach. Yeah, that sounds appropriate. I do think that there's uh, probably some undervaluing that happens on the coach's part. Uh, and then also just the element that a lot of part-time coaches are newer coaches and don't have the experience to charge the big monthly bucks yet. Mm-hmm. So I do think that you sometimes see that reflected where you've got a coach who's charging like 50 or 75 bucks uh, for a month <laughs> of program design. Ouch. Yeah. Yeah. Just because they a lacking number one experience and you do need experience, but then number two, some sense of self-worth and confidence. And yep. they don't think of themselves as 
a fitness professional yet because they're not doing this thing full time. But that sometimes uh, sometimes negates the fact that they're actually giving their clients an amazing service and providing incredible value. Mm-hmm. So I do think there's good opportunity to look inside and saying, yeah. are you actually charging what you're worth as yeah. a part-time coach? Yeah, exactly. Um, full-time. Yeah. Yeah, so this person is coaching full time. This is like their their main earner, right? They're uh their professional coach at this point, right? Like this is what they're doing all in. Um this is their craft, right? Coaching is their craft and when a coach goes from part-time to full-time, just the way that they look at coaching is completely different. Just completely different because it's no longer a side hustle to that coach. Yep. Um it's no longer something that if it goes away, oh, it's okay. I got this. I have this other thing, right? Like shit gets real here when a, when a coach goes full time into coaching and that shows, uh, in the way that they view or the way that their value is perceived to your previous point. Like this coach usually isn't charging $50 a month for program design and and individual coaching, um, because they understand the dollars and cents and they're like, I have to actually make a living doing this thing. So that self-perceived value should immediately go up when the realization of, Hey, this is the only way that I'm making money. Um, that, that self-perceived value should go up at this point. Um, this person is working under another entity, right? Cause they don't own their own business quite yet. So we'll get to the, the next point, um, or we'll get to the next point in the next stage. But, um, here we're saying that you're coaching full time under someone else. So you're not like spinning up your own LLC and creating a remote coaching business, right? You're an owner at that point. So right now you're working for someone else. So there's not that massive pressure, although it's there still, there's not that massive pressure to go out and like feed yourself and find all of your own clients. But uh, no matter what stage you're in, you're, you're always going to have to uh, have that entrepreneur, right? That entrepreneur uh, side to you. Um, so you're, 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 although you're not owning your own thing, you're not off doing this on your own, you're probably thinking, weighing the positives and negatives of doing this by yourself, right? Because if you're working for someone, you're giving a percentage of your income to that person. There's like a value exchange, right? It's like, I don't want to handle this, 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 this. It's like, I want this other person to do this or this other entity to do it. So this person has a decision to make. Do I want to be an owner or not? I think you uh, see some interesting conflict arise at this stage uh, because it is where someone is making that decision. Do I want to do my own thing, potentially make more money, but then potentially have higher risk? Or do I want to keep working under this person? And there's a lot of personalities in fitness as well. And so I have seen and heard so many stories of coaches who are in that full-time role under someone else's business have a falling out with the business owner because the business owner isn't in line with their vision and what they really want to achieve in fitness. So some people can stay in that role and have a great happy relationship as the coach under an owner for forever. It can be great, but you can also run into the situation where you both have competing ideas around what fitness means and what you both want to provide to clients. And so that's just an interesting challenge to navigate at that point. Like you do have to make that decision because as a full-time coach, you want to make sure you're doing something you believe in. Like mm-hmm. it's no longer just this thing on the side. You've got to be, you're in it a hundred percent. You've got to be able to stand behind what you're offering. So you have to be working with people that you can, uh, you can do that with. Yeah. And I think, um, that's why, that's why I brought up, like you, you always have that decision to make when you're in this, when you're in this, uh, stage. And I would, I would say that we have to expect all coaches to have that falling out. What, even if it's not like a, you know, I hate you. I hate what you're doing. Like there is going to be, we're all going to come to a point where we're like, yeah, I, I just don't want to work for this entity anymore. Like, and that that's that not good or bad or anything like that. It's just reality. So I can't think of one coach that has died, <laughs> that spent 25 years and just like died working for this company, uh, coaching people. Um, you know, I, I think we can get into the weeds with like, you know, different models and stuff like that. But I'm, I'm talking like, Hey, you have a book of clients that you're working with when you're working with those clients, that business has nothing to do with it, right? Like that business isn't coming in and like doing your consultations for you. That business isn't coming in and, you know, designing behavior programs for you. They're not doing any of that, right? It's all you and your clients. You're going to come to a point where you're just like, yeah, I'm going to go with this other company or I'm just going to go off and do this on my own. 
it's just, I think it's a huge rarity for that alignment to be there forever. Absolutely. Yep. Uh, I do think that the manager persona is fairly important at this stage. I don't know if you agree with that or not, but like yeah. going from part time where you can get away with some suboptimal practices around your own like habits and Mm -hmm. I mean sometimes you're working multiple jobs so you have to be really dialed in but if not if coaching was just this casual thing that you didn't have great systems in place around as a Mm -hmm. part-time coach as a full-time coach trying to continue to grow a book of clients you can't get away with that yeah here I actually put um, all three personas have to be uh, apparent, like yeah. very apparent based on who you are, right? Because you could be a full-time coach working for an entity and you're completely fine. You're like, I do not, I never want to work for someone else, right? There still has to be the artistry because you're working with clients. There still has to be the manager to your point. You now have a full book of clients. So let's say that you're coaching 50 individuals. It's like, you better understand how to manage your time. You better understand how to manage your client load, so on and so forth. And then the entrepreneur piece still shines, even if you have no intention on going and working on your own or for another, co- or you're, you're just good staying right there because you're bringing in clients. Like you're your own business to like, you could be a, an employee or a contractor. You're your own business because you're the one that's working with those clients. Your that business isn't working with those clients. So, so all three I believe here are, this is the, this is the phase where all three have to be extremely apparent and have to be there based on where you want to go. Yeah, completely agree. Yep. What do you think uh, cash potential is here? 40K to 250K. Yeah. Huge, yep. huge window there. Um, and the reason why it's so big is it's, it's, it's all based on how much you're charging and how many clients can you actually coach. Yeah. You know, we know coaches that coach 20. And that's their ceiling, right? That's their ceiling. They're like, I can't handle any more than 20. What's the conversation with those coaches? It's like, you better increase your value, right? You got to, you have to charge a lot more than if you were obviously coaching 40, right? Um, if you want to make that dollar amount. And then we know coaches that have great value and they still coach 100 people, right? So um, it's easy math, right? Like we can step back and say, okay, the business is probably taking anywhere from 40 to 60 percent of that coach's uh overall income um the coach is receiving the rest multiply that by the amount of clients they're they're coaching per month times 12 and then we get their uh annual income that's a question i get from like probably 50 percent of people coming into ccp is how many people can i coach <laughs> like they want they want the magic number and there is no magic number there is i mean there is a magic number it's figuring out what you want to make uh to cover mm-hmm. your expenses and be able to live the life you want to live and figuring out what the price point and number of clients is to get you there. But like you said, for some people that's 20 and some people that's a hundred clients and you got to, you do have some wiggle room with Mm -hmm. price per month, but you can't think that you can charge $800 for clients, coach 20 people. If you're a new coach in a crappy facility. Yeah. Yeah. And (laughs) I think, uh, yeah, what I would say, what I would say to those coaches or, uh, prospective coaches is like, gosh, that's such such a tough one that you'll eventually have to answer when you start to work with people. Um, Because when you get to five, you might think, oh my gosh, I can do this with 50 tomorrow if I had to. Or you can get to five and you're like, I have no idea how I'm going to get to six. Like I can't manage my time. I'm really slow. I don't get it. You know, so I think that is so coach by coach. Definitely. Definitely. Jinx. (laughs) I don't know what you do. What do you, what do you, what do Australians do when it's a, uh, that jinx thing. you just can't speak. You that's, can't speak. That's what, yeah, that's what we did yeah. in the Midwest. And too. I've, I've forgotten how you get to speak again. I think. Never. You can never speak again. No, I think what it is, is if I was then like talking, you would ha- try and say exactly the same thing that I said. And if we lined up, then you'd be able to speak again. What if you miss? Do you get punched in the uh, face? You get or punched something? in the arm. Oh, not yeah. the face. No, yeah, not we went face. face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we went face. <laughs> Brutal in the Midwest. Yeah. From the from the hood, girl. Yes. All right. Um, owner. Owner. Yeah. Let's let's uh, let's go there. So, um, this is where it gets weird, right? The owner now has two full time jobs, right? So we're we're saying that you're not in you haven't been a gym owner for six years, right? And you don't have a bunch of coaches underneath you. That would be the next stage. You are a sole proprietor, so you own your own business, and you're the only coach inside of that business. So now. You have a full-time job of running that business, and you also have a full-time job of coaching the clients inside of that business. So this is where a lot of coaches 
yeah, I would say, I'll say a lot of coaches. I won't say most coaches, but a lot of coaches get here and they're like, oh, fuck, I need to go back down uh, because they don't understand that now you have two full time jobs and they don't have like really solid systems in place. No one has solid systems in place when they go from full time to owner like that unless they go through business accelerator. Um, <laughs> no one has solid systems in place. That's a little like <laughs> little nudge. Yeah, yeah, a little nudge. Um, no one has those those systems in place. So they're just not ready for it. You're just not ready for that until you experience it. Um, it's always such a beautiful idea to own a, a fitness business. I remember when I first did it, I was just like, what? Like, I'm going to own a gym? Yeah, this is going to be great. And it's a typical story of like, you see how your life is going to be. It's just like, training and that's it right like training and training and coaching people and then training again and then coaching people again and then have a bunch of time to spend with your family and all that um yeah for me it was kind of that actually um but i got lucky i got lucky i had some really good people around me um and i was never just the sole proprietor like when i spun it up i i was i had coaches underneath me right away um and i'd like general managers and stuff like that so it was i got really really lucky so uh most people don't get really really lucky um so you have two full-time jobs um you could be good here or you could be thinking about hey i need to scale this thing up and scaling this thing up in this point is like hey i want to bring on more coaches because now that entrepreneur really starts to shine and they're like okay how can i make more as a business owner and the the answer to that is usually uh, or how that's uh how that question is asked is usually attached with how do i make more with not doing more yeah um and that's hey you need to bring on coaches underneath you and you need to understand that there's expense structures or cost of goods sold that's uh, associated with that and you're gonna have to pay them so you're gonna make a little bit less well not a little bit you're gonna make a decent chunk less on each client but when you start to look at like scalability of that, you know, you can get, you could put 50 more clients into this thing and you don't have to coach any of them, right? And you're taking 40 to 60% of that, that um, total income that's coming in. So um, yeah, this person's usually there. This person needs to be aware of burnout. This person needs to be aware that they have two full-time jobs. And this person needs to also think, what is the next stage for me? Where do I want to go? Yeah. I mean, do you see people, I, I know the answer to this, but you see people in this stage feeling ready to move on from coaching as well and like wanting to be the entrepreneur and focus more on the business uh, and really like bring coaches in underneath them to actually step back from the day-to-day of working with clients. So for some people that can just be an evolution in what they want to do in their day-to-day in their job. Yeah. But I just, I just want to be really clear that not everyone, and I know you're not saying this, but not everyone should think that way. No. There's a lot of coaches that sit here that should never even think about spinning this thing up to anything more because they're making the money they want to make by being the sole coach owner. They're happy. They're fulfilled. They have good systems in place. They don't want to worry about coaching other coaches. Um, they just they just want to put those systems in place so they can now enjoy being that artist again as the owner. And we have some of those in uh, – uh, as OPEX gyms, we have a couple of those that come to mind that are just like, hey, I'm good. I have 45 clients. I coach all 45 of them. I make great money. My expenses are really low. Don't pressure me to grow this thing any bigger. And I think that's where we can get into trouble when we're all when we're like putting this templated message out like you got to make more money. You got to get more clients. You got to do this. It's like, what if the person doesn't need to make more money? What if they don't want to get more clients? What You know what I'm saying? So um, I, I just I just want to be careful in saying that, like, you know, once you get to this owner stage or even that full-time stage, it's okay if you stay there if you don't want to move on. Yeah. It's okay to stay at part-time if you don't want to move yeah. on from there to uh, to be real. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. What would someone make as an owner? What's the range? <sighs> the uh, So the range for um, full-time was 40 to 250. For owner, it is forty to two fifty. I was gonna say zero to two fifty. No, no. So revenue. I'm not yeah, saying profit. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Just revenue. It's still forty to two fifty, yeah. right? Um, why is that? You're still the person that's coaching the people inside of this thing, yep. right? And we're talking about revenue. We're not talking about profit. So we're not taking expenses or cost of goods sold out. So that full time coach 
was bringing in that much revenue. Doesn't mean they were making that much. They're just bringing in that much revenue. Got it. Um, because there's such a wide range of you know takes from the full time coach and working for another entity. I don't want to like bucket out there and say you should be taking this as a as a business owner. You should be okay with this as a coach. So yeah, revenue is the same because you're not scaling up technically, right? You're still coaching the people that you're coaching, and you don't have people underneath you. Let's go to the next step, coach of coaches. All right, coach of coaches. Um, this person might be coaching less people. Yeah. Right. So you're an owner, and you have coaches underneath you. So um, usually, when people make the decision to bring in more coaches, well, let, let let me not say usually. You're in two camps. You're like, I'm coaching all these people. I need to scale this thing up more. I want to make some more money. I want to impact more people. I want to give coaches an opportunity, but I don't want to lessen my client load. Right. So they're just like keeping their client load going, and then they're just plucking or putting like one or two coaches underneath them and that client load is increasing so the net client load for the entire business is moving north that's camp one camp two is hey i need to scale this thing up because i need more time to be an entrepreneur i need more time to be a manager um so they're bringing in coaches and then they're lessening their client load but they're not seeing a hit in revenue of course and they're not seeing a hit in profits because they're bringing those new clients in at a you know 2x rate that they were able to coach people or bring people in for themselves. Um, they're distributing a percentage of their clients to their coaches. Uh, they now start to, they have to think about, you know, now you have to be a very good mentor uh, and you have to be a good manager of people um, for your coaches. And when someone's here, you're either good here or you're thinking about, okay, how can I do this thing bigger? Um, or of course you're like, Hey, this isn't for me. I want to go back down. I don't want to manage people. I don't want to mentor coaches. I just want to get rid of those coaches and do this thing all by myself. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely a bunch of new challenges that arise here. And one that comes to mind is you did a great job as a full-time coach. And then as an owner, sole proprietor of spinning up this coaching business where you knew there was going to be going to be great consistency and all clients were going to get this equal service. You bring in other coaches and in that role as their manager and as the coach of coaches, you've got to make sure all of those coaches are, I don't want to say another version of you, but pretty much another version mm -hmm. of you offering clients a very consistent service. We all have our own flair, yep. but there has to be uh, consistency between everyone on the team. And that's, that's tough. Yeah. So sorry, I didn't, I was just thinking, we didn't say the uh, persona of the uh, owner. So that, oh, that, yeah, the owner entrepreneur. Would, yeah, it would be entrepreneur, yeah. obviously, yeah. right? Okay. <laughs> so sorry, back to coach of coaches. The persona there would be, uh, you have to be a manager. You have to be a really, really good manager at this point. Anytime you put other people in the equation, it just gets, it gets more difficult um, for some people. Uh, some people don't have any experience leading people or experience managing people, and they just expect everyone to do things the way that they would have done those. So uh, you have to be really patient. So with that, you have to be a really good manager at this stage. Definitely. Uh, is it at this point or is it at the next point that someone could also be bringing in people to help with marketing and a general manager and like other people to potentially look after areas that are not their strong suits? Yeah, this would actually happen. This would start happening at that owner stage, right? Yeah. So you could be the person that's solely coaching people and you can bring in additional support to try to grow your, your book of clients or your business. Got it. And uh, you've got other coaches underneath you. They hopefully have clients that are bringing good. in cash. <laughs> That'd what's, be good. What's the range? Uh, 80K yeah. to 500K in, yep. of revenue. So we have to, uh, for context, we went from 40 to 250. So if we're adding in one or two additional human beings that are coaching, we should at least double the revenue, net revenue, or sorry, total revenue that we're bringing in. So we, we're going from 40 to 250 to 80 to 500 in revenue. Our final stage is uh, scale. Scale. All right. This uh, this person or this coach, um, they have been a coach of coaches for some time. They should be a coach of coaches for some time before they're trying to scale this thing out even more. Um, they might have even less or no clients at this point, right? So they may now see themselves as like the puppeteer or the entrepreneur or the, the person that like pulls the strings. Um, you can obviously in this stage still coach people, but, you know, some people might actually – go a stage up from coach of coaches. They're like, okay, I'm going to lessen my client load. And then now I'm going to eliminate my client load so I can really focus on scaling up the business. Um, they're looking at opening up more facilities or they're looking at spinning up additional businesses um, or they're looking at 
scaling the businesses that they have in a much different way. And I had to add that one because there's there's different ways to scale businesses rather than like opening up more facilities or, um, you know, creating new LLCs, right? Like you can create like some fairly robust partnerships. You can uh, partner with like uh, corporations and start getting into there and bring on more coaches. And now you have like this corporate wing and then you have your on-site thing and you might have your remote thing. So it's someone that's looking to do more, right? Do more. So yeah, that's, that would be scale. Someone that's looking to uh, take, take the next step after they uh, have some coaches underneath them. And is it fair to say this person's the entrepreneur again? This is back to the entrepreneur. Yeah. 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 So, you know, the, they're, they're not coaching. Isn't their main focus anymore. Like coaching individuals isn't their main focus um, for them personally. Now it's like, Hey, I need to duplicate the successes that I had as an owner and a coach of coaches. And I need to put really good SOPs in place and how I want the coaches underneath me to coach people because obviously I saw success doing that. So I'm like creating this business around what was successful when I was the only one doing it. So they're they're scaling up their abilities to coach people. What would you say is cash range here? Cash range, 150000 to call it a million plus. Yeah. Yeah, and revenue per year. I uh, think it's an interesting time here as we sit thinking about scale to reflect on how many times I've seen gym owners think that the solution to their problems is going to be to open a second facility or add like some entirely different revenue stream or uh, to try to scale the business in a different way uh, rather than fixing the problem that's right in front of them and the thing that's broken, they just try to add something else. And it feels like a good reminder that although you don't have to climb the progression from not a coach to, to scale. You don't have to go all the way up. You can't get all the way up without actually having gone through all of those yeah. steps in a really robust way before. Yeah, so. most, most coaches don't sit here. Most coaches will shouldn't even touch this, right, unless they bring on a, a partner that um, has a different brain than them. And I'm not saying coaches are incompetent to do this. There's a number of coaches that have done this very successfully. But I'm just saying that the things that make a good good coach – don't also transform them into being able to be a, an extremely great scaler of businesses. Um, they're just they're just too different. They're two very very different uh, personas. So um, a good question for everyone to ask themselves. It's like, what is your persona, right? Like, what is that persona that just shines no matter what? What is that persona that feels the best when that one is turned on? Um, usually, it's not two or three. Usually it's just one. So for someone to be an outstanding coach, it's probably just such a good artist, right? Can that artist learn how to manage? Can that artist learn how to be a visionary? Yes, but you don't want to take away the artistry so they're focusing on that 100% because this is what makes them really good at what they do. So because uh, the persona that to scale something is so entrepreneur, and the persona to be a great full-time coach is so artist, like you're probably not both of those things. So scale is is one of those things where, you know, most conversations that I have with uh, business owners that are looking to scale, it's like I just challenge it. I'm like, why? Why do you want to do that? You know, like would you be happy with, you know, two or three xing the responsibilities that you have right now? And they're like, no, of course not. It's like, so why do you want to two, two or three x it? You know, it's like, why do you want to deal with another lease? Why do you want to deal with another group of coaches at that facility by yourself, right? It's like we can scale inside of the owner and we can scale inside of the coach of coaches uh, stage. We could just scale in different ways. And uh, the way to scale for most people is attached to financials. And it's like there are ways to increase your bottom line without adding additional facilities or additional businesses. Definitely. Well, guys, we love to make sure we create content that's relevant for you. And we want to know where you are in your coaching journey. So if you're on YouTube or even if you're on podcast, leave us a comment or review. Let us know what stage are you at in your coach's life cycle and maybe what personality type uh, or persona you identify with as well uh, because we can make sure we incorporate that and include that in uh, the content we put out in the future. Like, subscribe, leave us a review. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Definitely appreciate it. And uh, we'll see you next week. Thanks, guys.